I'm Ryan Pack, and this is Soundtrack Your Life, where we talk to a guest about a soundtrack that they feel connected to. Returning to the podcast today, we have Brian Colburn of the My Weekly Mixtape Podcast. Welcome back, Brian. Thanks so much for having me again, man. Looking forward to this. Last time that you were on, we talked about That Thing You Do, and I introduced you as Brian of the Playlist Wars podcast, which is still your podcast. You guys are on a break. Mm Mm-hmm. That's correct. So why don't you tell our listeners about My Weekly Mixtape? Well, My Weekly Mixtape is a show that spawned from basically what I did with my friends growing up. When I was a kid, one of my favorite things to do would be to record different songs off the radio, take different cassettes and dub them onto a cassette, or as I got older, take different songs from different CDs and record them onto tapes, or as time went on, burn CDs with different songs. But when I would get together with my buddies, what we would do, especially when we were younger with cassettes, was we would go back and forth and we would build these mixtapes together as friends, kind of exposing each other to different artists we like, different music, and then we'd each take a copy home. And it turned into something that I thought that would make an interesting podcast where I bring somebody on who I'm not whether it's an artist or a a podcaster or a good friend, it could be somebody I'm very close with or someone that I only know through podcasting and have a musical conversation through the songs that we pick. And with playlists now, a lot of people just drag hundreds of songs into a playlist and hit shuffle. What I'm trying to do is bring back the thought process of why songs sound better back to back when you're actually taking the time to create this statement in a mixtape. So Yes, the word mixtape does sound older, but I'm trying to, the show is called the Playlist Curation Podcast because it's all about the art and beauty of taking songs and putting them in a specific order for a reason versus just randomly dragging and clicking shuffle. Yeah, I understand that. I still do that with playlists, even on streaming. No, I put them in a specific order and I don't shuffle it because I want to listen to it in that order. That's exactly how I've every playlist I have has a specific order and rhyme or reason to it. And they only have a specific affinite number of songs because once I get to that point, that's the story I wanted to tell with that playlist. I go to a different playlist and tell a different story. Yeah, exactly. I would even do that for like friends, like who are having parties, you know, I'd make a, I'd make a playlist and I'd be like, don't hit shuffle. Like I put it in a specific order. This is how this party is going to get hyper and hyper and hyper as Mm -hmm. we keep going. (laughs) You know, and sometimes you have the song that um, you have like a pop song and then you follow it up with the song that they sampled. You know, like it's very intentional. Yes. And the fun part of my weekly mixtape is I get to make some of these mixtapes with the artists themselves. So the artists come on the show and I get to, as a fan, create the ultimate mixtape playlist or set list if you want to call it that based on my love of that band's music from a fan perspective and that artist's perspective being the artist themselves so i've been able to do that with groups like the spin doctors um collective soul everclear huey lewis in the news billy joel's band and to me it's just been an incredible experience to be able to collaborate i know that seems odd but we are collaborating for that one hour on putting together a mix of songs kind of bouncing bouncing back and forth between the fan perspective and the artist perspective so to me it's a fascinating discussion just as the person recording it i hope that translates to those who are listening yeah definitely i'm i really enjoy the artist episodes i mean obviously you have a lot of cool guests uh, including myself of course. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I, I will admit I've had a little bit of, of uh, guest envy when I've seen some of the people that you've been able to pull for. Um, but, you know, it's, it's been really fun to listen to. Um, I remember growing up listening to Everclear and, you know, I've, I saw them live on the So Much for the Afterglow tour and, um, you know, brought back a lot, of, a lot of good memories for me to listen to that episode specifically. Awesome. Thank you so much, man. So, Brian, today we are going to talk about the 1993. Today we're going to talk about the 1993 Stephen Hopkins film Judgment Night. 
Well, we're going to talk about the soundtrack for the film Judgment Night. <laughs> Thank God, because uh, spoiler alert, bomb drop, I've never seen the movie. <laughs> yeah, me neither. So let's get that out of the way. Neither of us have seen the movie, so this is going to be a very music-heavy episode. My friends Lily and Hannah of the um, Society of the Neogenics podcast, uh, they covered this a couple years ago. And I remember asking them, do I need to watch the movie? Like, you guys watch the movie for the episode. Like, does that add anything to the soundtrack? And they said, nope, you don't need to watch it. We watched for you, so you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> the beauty about this is, though, the soundtrack, this is one of those rare instances where a soundtrack eclipses the movie in every stretch of the imagination. The movie only got a, on Rotten Tomatoes, a tomatometer score of 35% and an audience score of 54%. So this is not a well-beloved movie. This is kind of a bomb. But the soundtrack is iconic in so many ways. And I'll be honest, I feel like this soundtrack is the reason new metal became a viable genre because the labels saw what happened on this soundtrack and bands started propping up that used this vibe as a sound. And I feel like this is one of the reasons we have the new metal movement. Yeah, and that's that's a great point. The person who kind of put together the soundtrack, um, his name is his name was Happy Walters, and he was Cypress Hill and the House of Pain manager at the time. He was 22 years old, and he started Immortal Records. And that's what this soundtrack came out on. And if you fast forward just a handful of years, you know, Immortal Records signs a band out of Bakersfield, California called Korn. 100%. And I'll tell you, House of Pain and Cypress Hill at this point in time in the 90s had their finger on the pulse of what was hot in hip hop. 1993 was a big year for both bands. And what they put together on this album is nothing short of miraculous because some of these pairings are once off, once in a lifetime collaborations that never came to anything else beyond that, but are cemented in this amazingly unique soundtrack. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these bands have not gone back to the sound. They haven't collaborated, you know, they haven't crossed that uh, boundary of collaboration again. Um, and there was a little bit of resistance to the idea by a lot of artists. So I read that uh, Sonic Youth, Helmet, and Faith No More were immediately into the idea. And this, this is a, a quote from Happy Walters in, in Rolling Stone. And obviously, you know, he's, Happy Walters is managing Cypress Hill and House of Pain. So whether they wanted to or not, they were going to be part of it. But, you know, um, Cypress Hill, they, they were on Lollapalooza. So they were hanging out with all these rock bands anyway. Right. And there was always something about Cypress Hill that there was a love for rock music in their sound right from the beginning. You take a song like uh, We Ain't Going Out Like That, and what's the sample in it? It's Black Sabbath's The Wizard. I mean, there was always a love for rock in the core of Cypress Hill, which is something I love about them. Yeah, and even to this day, their DJ now is Mixmaster Mike, who is, you know, the Beastie Boys DJ. And I feel like they kind of, I like the Beastie Boys where they kind of, they live in this gray area between hip hop and rock. 100%. Yes. So, one of my favorite songs on here, and it's probably like the strangest song, is the Teenage Fan Club and De La Soul pairing. A song called Fallen. And, you know, when people think about Judgment Night, the soundtrack, they're thinking of, you know, very heavy, heavy, heavy sound. And this is almost like. It's still, it's still, you know, a rock-driven song, but it's almost more on the pop side. 100%. I mean, look, any song that samples my favorite artist of all time in Tom Petty for the falling part, obviously this one hit home with me right from the first time I heard it. And this song also sampled Fly Like an Eagle by Steve Miller and Funky President, People It's Bad by James Brown. So 
there was some fantastic uses of samples in this song. But on top of that, this is one of the most seamless combinations across the whole soundtrack because Teenage Fan Club, their sound was not necessarily like what you hear on this song. They were a little heavier, a lot more distortion. But what they did is they leaned in as a band to what made De La Soul special and kind of morphed their sound to fit with De La Soul. So they never tried to rewrite De La Soul's book. Instead, they tried to complement the strengths that De La Soul brought to the table. And to me, that was a very selfless musical act that came across in this fantastic track that shows Teenage Fan Club stepping out of their element at that time. And I think it was a bold move, and I think it paid off in droves because this song is amazing. Yeah, and for the longest time, this was one of the few 90s De La Soul songs that you could find on streaming because of licensing issues. Uh, just earlier this year, you could they started re-releasing um, all their, you know, kind of golden era albums, starting with, you know, Three Feet and Rising. But for the longest time, like, this was one of the few De La Soul tracks that you could find on streaming. It's a good one, but, you know, it, it was it was really sad that, you know, People didn't have that opportunity to find, you know, a lot of their hits until now. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So what are some of your favorite pairings on this soundtrack? Well, I'm going to have to go right to the title track, track four, Biohazard and Onyx, Judgment Night. It's the album's premier track. I mean, it's a pairing that moves beyond the soundtrack. So a lot of these pairings, it was kind of one off, but Biohazard and Onyx have a history beyond the soundtrack, which I love because Onyx has a very unique hip hop style between uh, Fredro Starr, Suave and Sticky Fingers. They each had this manic, aggressive delivery that always felt like a perfect complement to rock, even as Onyx without the guitars on their albums like back the fuck up they had songs like throw your guns and the original slam those rocked like rock songs but they had the hip-hop beat to it and that was all because of how onyx could deliver a vocal line now slam has double meaning here because biohazard and onyx teamed up for the bionics remix of the already platinum slam and that remix took off like wildfire i remember hearing it on rock stations and metal stations around the new york new jersey area and when they were done the song after the bionics remix became double platinum so obviously this opened up onyx to a whole new world of listeners that were not necessarily hip hop heads at first, but Biohazard and Onyx brought them together and it brought hip hop heads into the hardcore scene and hardcore fans into the hip hop scene. So the fact that they did this again on Judgment Night and combined on an original track to me spoke volumes. And I mean, it's the perfect pairing on the album. I, I honestly wish the producers spent as much time on the film's plot as this masterpiece of a soundtrack because this soundtrack does so much for music and from what everybody's told me i'm saving my time just keeping it my love for the soundtrack only so yeah i mean i've talked to plenty of people you know Movies like Empire Records, which kind of bombed at first and were critically not loved, they found a second life. And, you know, now we, now we celebrate Rex Manning Day. And, <laughs> you know, and there's movies like that. I think Tank Girl is another one where it had a cool soundtrack. People didn't quite like the movie at first, or at least critically it wasn't there. But, you know, people came to appreciate. I still can't find people that are like, no, 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 no. You really need to go back and see Judgment Night. Completely agree. And uh, another track, uh, if you don't mind, if I move on to another one that I'm a huge fan of, sure. is Living Color and Run DMC, Me, Myself, and My Microphone. I mean, look, Run DMC is not a stranger to rapping over a rock riff. Right. So you think about Kings of Rock, their version of Walk This Way with Aerosmith, Raisin Hell, Tougher Than Leather. Run DMC always incorporated rock into their sound. So to me, 
this song was not shocking of a pairing because I am used to hearing Run DMC rap over guitars. However, Run DMC are pioneers of this genre and they mixed in one of the most underrated rock and hard rock bands of the 80s, Living Color. I mean, these guys have talent oozing from their veins, cult of personality, type, yeah. glamour boys. These guys are an amazing band that always see, like cult of personality blew up. I don't know how every song they released in succession of that did not blow up as well. I don't know why they didn't hold on because they have the talent type from the second album times up is absolutely amazing. But what I love about me, myself and my microphone, it's run DMC doing what they do, but in the chorus, living color brings in this signature melodic tendency that they have on their sound that brought DMC out of their comfort zone a little bit, but they still made it work because normally the songs for run DMC, when they sample guitars, it kind of just stays in this verse area where the riff is kind of going through the verse and the chorus, except for songs like walk this way. But here, there's a melody going on in this chorus, and there's some harmonies going on underneath between the guitars and the instruments. There's a melody at hand here, and Run DMC rapping over that for the chorus works so damn well. So, I mean, look, Run DMC proves time and time again that they are the kings of rock, decade be damned, and this song has to be mentioned with this soundtrack because they're one of the best that ever lived in hip hop. Yeah, I don't think you could make this soundtrack without including them. Like, I think they kind of tie the whole thing together. Yeah, I think the the DJ, DJ Muggs from Cypress Hill was saying like, there was definitely kind of a narrative going on in the 90s where you either were into hard rock and metal or you were a rap person. Like, there was a line between the two which now sounds super silly. It does. I mean, I've always lived in the gray. I always loved hip hop growing up and I loved rock music. And when they came together, I'm like, this is like two things I love. This is a swirl of ice cream of two different flavors making this unique flavor. That's amazing. So I've always been a fan of rock and hip hop being combined. I love it. I love the merging of genres. And in this case, it's probably the best mer hip hop. And country, I'm not as big a fan of. Uh, I feel like almost, I mean, some of it does really, really work when it's done well, but others of it feel almost forced. And I don't want to like downplay any artist because that's not what I'm about. But sometimes with rock music, it just flows together so seamlessly where you could take two styles and merge them together in a track where it almost feels like two different songs. And that happens on the opening track of judgment night. You right. mentioned paint, you mentioned page Hamilton and helmet and then house of pain, just another victim. That is literally two different songs melded together by some studio magic helmet did their jam at the beginning. And then house of pain came in and took the guitar, slowed it down, took the beat, flipped it on its side and did their verses over the end. So if you were going to mention a disjointed track on this album, even Paige Hamilton said in an interview, yeah, it kind of came together in a disjointed manner, but it still works. It still rocks both ends of it. But this song kind of sticks out like a sore thumb because the rest of the songs across the album really feel like the bands are coming together as one, where in this song, it feels like, Helmet did their thing. House of Pain did their thing. And it's bridged by some feedback in a guitar. But I still love the track. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, it's still a great way to kick off the record. I think it's like a palate cleanser. You get your rock song, you get your hip hop song, and then you move into Teenage Fan Club and De La Soul and they've come together. So it's like the perfect kind of one-two punch to lead you into the rest of the album. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, the sequence of the the album's great. I I don't think I would switch anything around. But uh, yeah, I do like that one-two punch of Helmet to Teenage Fan Club. So um, what do you think about the Slayer and Ice-T track? 
Well, I'm a punk guy. I love the exploited. I love Wadi. He, they're awesome. And when I heard that Slayer and Ice T came together to cover the exploited on this album, I, I this was one of the first tracks I went to when I first got the CD. I cheated. I skipped right to five, and I listened to this one first because I was shocked at the time to see a thrash metal band and a metal group. Don't get me wrong. They used Ice-T as hip-hop, as the hip-hop side of this collaboration. But make no mistake, Ice-T was metal as well. Body Count was already well-established as a metal band. They'd already done Lollapalooza. So this was, in my mind, two metal groups coming together to honor a punk, a legendary punk band with a three-song medley. And to me, they knocked it out of the park. I love this one. It's so frantic. It's so intense. The exploited was all about energetic, loud, obnoxious punk and thrash metal brought that to a slightly different level because it hits differently, but it still hits just as hard. And ice T slays the vocals on it. I mean, it, it works so well. And it's, I'd say the most underrated song on the album for that reason, being in the fact that it is a trio of covers and it's not an original track that they did together. Some people kind of overlook this one, but to me, it's easily the most underrated track on the album. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. You know, sometimes people forget that I, Ice-T used to be a musician. You know, they mm-hmm. only think of him as the guy from SVU. <laughs> but yeah, you know, he has a metal background too. I feel like him and Run DMC are maybe the most comfortable on this, on this whole album. Oh, yeah. I mean, Ice-T just did his thing. This was not going out of any comfort zone because he did the same level of heavy, while not thrash heavy. You listen to a lot of songs on Body Count's first album, and there's some thrash elements in Body Count. Make no mistake about it. Yeah, and, you know, and we brought up Lollapalooza earlier. Like, he is a veteran of Lollapalooza. Cypress Hill is a is a veteran of Lollapalooza. Them being in the studio with rock musicians is not intimidating to them. Not in the slightest. If anything, it elevated both sides to a new level, which is, again, why I love this album so much. Yeah, and so Cypress Hill shows up twice. They have a collaboration with Sonic Youth and a collaboration with Pearl Jam, sans Eddie Vedder. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, they were supposed to show up a third time. Mud Honey wanted to do a song with Cypress Hill, but Happy Walters was like, that's too many. We can't have that many Cypress Hill songs on here. The Sonic Youth and Cypress Hill song, I've always felt it to be a palate cleanser on this album. I mean, I was shocked to find that Cypress Hill was featured on a song promoting marijuana first. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Cypress Hill, like I mentioned earlier, they are no stranger to incorporating elements of rock in their songs. I talked about Black Sabbath's The Wizard being sampled, and I ain't going out like that. Think about years later, they had Rock Star was a big hit. Mm -hmm. Uh, Rock Superstar was their hit. I'm sorry. Um, And then years later, they did Rise Up with with Tom Morello. And then remember, Be Real was in a band with Chuck D and three members of Rage Against the Machine doing The Prophets of Rage. But back to I Love You, Mary Jane. This song, Sonic Youth, really brought the perfect, trippy, psychedelic backdrop for an ode to weed. I mean, the the track is trippy in all the sense. Like, if you listen to it on headphones, it like the sounds are just swirling in your head. It feels like you're high listening to it musically. And coming out of faith no more and booyah tribe which was one of the premier tracks on the album one of the singles and then going into mud honey and sir mix a lot it really feels like a palate cleanser in between the two and it stands out for that and then obviously the one with pearl jam i mean come on it's as close to a perfect piece of rap rock as you can get i mean pearl jam provided the perfect musical backdrop for the guys in Cypress Hill to do their thing. And while I love you, Mary Jane was that trip trippy interlude on an otherwise heavy album. 
The real thing shows that Cypress Hill can bring the rock just as hard as any other artist on this album. And it's why they continue to do it. And I honestly, no other album, there's no other song on this album that should close it other than real thing. It is the album closer. It's perfect in that slot. Yeah. And you can tell that Pearl Jam really wanted to make it work. They were not just going to phone it in and, you know, make some sort of, you know, Pearl Jam sounding riff and just having it loop. They wanted to, like Stone Gossard and Jeff Ament are pretty big hip hop fans. And, you know, they took it seriously. We're going to work with Cypress Hill. We're going to make a great Cypress Hill song. And another thing you have to tip your hat to those two is they're, they're musical chameleons because when they did the album with Neil Young, Mirrorball, they did not just play Pearl Jam underneath Neil Young. They played as if Crazy Horse was behind Neil Young for that record with a little bit of a Pearl Jam oomph to it. And I love that fact that they were able to kind of change their sound just enough that you know it's Pearl Jam, but it's definitely, make no mistakes about it, a Neil Young album. Same thing with the real thing in Cypress Hill. Right, and then they would do it again, or at least Mike McCready would do it again with Almost Famous and Stillwater. Exactly. Musical chameleons, man, I'm telling you. <laughs> I mean, when you're that talented, I guess you can do whatever you want. Yeah, but they do it well. So, I mean, that's the part that you might be able to do whatever you want, but sometimes it backfires, i.e. Metallica and Lou Reed's Lulu. But Pearl Jam's, you, people don't go back to that Neil Young album and say this was a low point for them. People go back and listen to that album with a degree of respect and awe for the two of them coming together. And it's a shame that the Metallica album didn't come out to be that for them and Lou Reed as well. Right. And you know that they're, they're huge fans of Lou Reed. It just, sometimes it doesn't work. Yep, yep. A little bit of oil and water there. Uh, so let's go back to the uh, Faith No More and Booyah Tribe song. It's instantly recognizable that it's Faith No More with that, that very thick bass. Um, I, I'm not super familiar with the Booyah Tribe. And they're kind of one of those 90s hip-hop artists that I kind of missed out on. But it's a lot of... I mean, I, I feel like Faith No More was very excited to do this soundtrack. Well, everybody in Faith No More except for Jim Martin who did not want to be a part of it. So Billy Gould, their keyboard player, actually plays guitar on this track, which surprises me. But Faith No More, this song is abs. This song rips. I mean, there's a reason why this was one of the singles. This song's amazing. And it charted in Ireland, New Zealand, and the UK. Somehow it didn't chart in the US, which shocks me. But Judgment Night is a worldwide beloved album here. And this is the reason that kind of launched it. And then something that I learned about this song in, in doing a little extra research for tonight, during the music video shoot for the single, Faith No More actually staged an intervention for Roddy Bottom, who had been dealing with heroin addiction at the time. And because of that intervention, he successfully quit and attended rehab and he's been clean. So, I mean, like, that's a, that's kind of a cool thing to come out of it, but yeah. that was a little musical fun fact that I'm like, what? I had no idea. You know, this was pre-internet in 1993. You had the CD notes and that was it. Right. Yeah, I don't even think they had like message groups that you could join to, to get the gossip. No, you'd get the paper mailers. Some bands did postcards, some bands did fanzines, but nothing like it is now. I think the Dell the Funky Homo Sapien feature on this album is just kind of a precursor, like it, you know, prophetic of kind of how his career would go from there, you know. Obviously, he would have a lot of success with Gorillaz about seven or eight years later. Mm -hmm. and, that would, and that album kind of, while well, maybe not necessarily a rock album, would kind of, I think, permanently break this barrier between, you know, rock and rap not being able to collaborate. 100% agree. I mean, look, Dell is an underrated hip-hop legend. He, wore, he was in Ice Cube's The Lynch Mob group. And he had some great solo albums. And then you think about, like you said, Clint Eastwood. He has a very unique style and flow to his lyrical delivery. And on paper, when you listen to Mudhoney's music, I'm sorry, 
I apologize. That was Freak Mama. When you listen to Dinosaur Jr.'s music, they don't sound like they would work well together, but Dinosaur Jr. brought this jammy alt rock background to Missing Link that really worked with Dell's flow. I don't know if any other rapper on this mix could have nailed this song the way he did. Yeah, he's a very versatile rapper. Um, I think that's why he works so well with like gorillas and why he can jump on a Dr. Octagon track because, you know, he can kind of, he's so nimble with his delivery and he can rap about things that don't make any sense. And somehow they'll make sense because it's coming out of his mouth. Yeah. He makes the things that are not understandable, understandable. And you're like, wait a minute, what did he just say? (laughs) It sounded good. Yeah, I, I, I saw him perform in a record store, and the entire time he just had a skateboard under his foot, and he was just rolling the skateboard back and forth while he was rapping. Really? Yeah. Huh. So I, I almost feel like rapping is, like, boring for him, where he needs to be doing something else while he's doing it. Oh, I mean, listen to his albums, though. I mean, the, the his albums are, again, I use the word underrated a lot, but... Del the Funky Homo Sapien is not a household name, and the fact that he isn't is a crime as far as I'm concerned. Oh, I agree. Yeah, those Deltron 3030 albums are great, you know, stuff with hieroglyphics. You know, one of the first hip-hop artists that I really, like, started diving into their catalog was Del. Yeah, and I mean, like, it took the gorillas for people to go, wait a minute, this guy's really good, and go back and kind of rediscover so Gorillaz was extremely helpful to him, but it shouldn't have had to have been because the other albums he put out were all quality leading up to it, including right. Missing Link. Yeah, I agree. So a band that's kind of a, l- a little bit on the underrated side is Therapy, and they are, and they get the the unenviable task of being right before Pearl Jam. Hundred percent. This is the song that I don't. I think most people went who and who, and but there's an element of hardcore here, and I love it. I think this is the most hardcore sounding track on the album, and I don't mean hardcore from a style of music. I mean Biohazard sound. Biohazard is a hardcore metal band. Therapy is as close to that as we're getting on this album. Helmet is metal with a little alternative a little hardcore mixed in but therapy and biohazard i feel like musically are the most aligned and come and die is one of those tracks that it's like thank you when i make a mixtape i always end up putting a deeper cut on a mixtape of songs a lot of people know so i can expose people to new artists or new songs they may not have heard. And I do it a lot on my weekly mixtape where I say, all right, I'm going deep for this next one. But when you listen to this playlist, it'll make sense. To me, Therapy and Fatal's Come to Die is that moment on this album. Because everyone talks about this album as a whole being so incredible, which it is. As a whole, it wouldn't be as good if Therapy and Fatal's Come to Die wasn't on it. And I wish more people knew about these, these two because it's a killer song. Yeah, like I, I remember watching MTV and I would see some therapy videos on 120 Minutes, but I knew nothing about Fatal and I still know very little about Fatal. It's a shame because, I mean, this album should be the launch that every artist on here deserved because, again, this is, I, this is an iconic soundtrack we're talking about here. This changed the face of music in some form. Whether people want to admit it or not, this album did a lot to make new metal happen. Well, I agree. And I mean, other bands were experimenting with hip hop. Um, I think, you know, R.E.M. on radio song, they had Karis mm-hmm. One. Um, you know, Chuck D does a little bit of singing on Sonic Youth's cool thing. Like people were already kind of experimenting on how to incorporate, you know, hip hop and rock together. But nobody talks about those, well, I guess Sonic Youth fans would talk about cool thing, but as far as, you know, the mainstream goes, you know, everyone points to, you know, Rage Against the Machine and Judgment. And the only other song I would add to that from two years earlier in 1991 would be Anthrax and Public Enemies Bring the Noise. Oh, that's a good one. I feel like that song kind of lit the match for the idea of Judgment Night 
which exploded and then lit the match for new metal. Because think about it between Aerosmith and run DMC's walk this way and run DMC, I'm sorry. And anthrax and public enemies bring the noise. Where was the massive rap rock crossover hit that there wasn't right. And this was an entire album full of them, which is to me is just amazing. And there would not be another album like this until I want to say it was 2000. And that loud rocks compilation that loud records put out that included system of a down with Ghostface killer and Riza and you God. It had, um, Incubus and big pun. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. That was the, the next time you would see it was seven years later. And that's insane. Yeah, I think there's a couple albums that are kind of like spiritually connected to Judgment Night, like the Spawn soundtrack. Mm -hmm. And then um, Memorial Records would, in 2002, put out the Blade 2 soundtrack, which is more like electronic and, and, and uh, hip hop. Yes. But, but they were kind of following like the direction of where rock music was going, like with industrial music and with electronic mm -hmm. music. That's just to do another volume of uh, rap rock. It made me. It made me wish that uh, Judgment Night had a soundtrack, even though I I never saw the movie. <laughs> uh, so there is one. So you know, Rage Against the Machine is kind of a a mix of rap and rock all the time. Like that. That was their sound. Like they weren't a hip hop band, but I would consider them kind of like a rap rock band, right? Definitely. And they, and so they were actually supposed to be on the soundtrack with Tool. I mean, think about how great Know Your Enemy is from Rage Against the Machine self-titled. Tool is on that album, on that track. And imagine another song from those two. I wish it happened, man. Oh, man, do I wish it happened. You know, they're supposed to do a song called Can't Kill the Revolution. And I guess it just didn't turn out how they wanted it to. So they just never ended up releasing it. It's been on bootlegs and things like that, but that's kind of the the white whale of this album. Is there supposed to be a Rage Against the Machine and Tool song? Oh God, I wish, I wish, I wish that would see the light of day. Yeah, just didn't, just didn't come together. But instead, we got Mud Honey and Sir Mix a Lot's Freak Mama. <laughs> yeah, so. Even though Sir Mix a Lot is also from Seattle, they didn't know him, and Mud Honey was hoping to get Cypress Hill. Look, I'll be honest, Mud Honey and Sir Mix a Lot did really work well together. This is the most fun song on the track. I mean, we're putting Baby Got Back kind of lyrics over a rock song. It's the least serious track on the album, but it still has a fun vibe to it. And Again, I don't know if this would work as a single from this album. I don't know if it would have been huge, but coming out of I Love You, Mary Jane and seeing where the prior seven songs came from, this is a moment of levity on this album that I think without it would make the album a darker listen as a whole. And I like the fact that this kind of brings up a little bit of a different vibe to it because it kind of gives you a little bit of that whole musical rap rock spectrum. That is why this album is just so intoxicating to listen to. Yeah, I think it's underrated as far as like what the many directions it goes in. Like I think people think of rap rock and they think of Judgment Night and they just think of like heavy guitars and like a rapper screaming over those heavy guitars. But, you know, with the Teenage Fan Club and Sonic Youth and mm -hmm. Mud Honey, Dinosaur Jr., you're like, it's not always as heavy as you think it's going to be. Exactly, 100%. So, new metal and that sort of metal rap kind of that's the that's the big legacy from the soundtrack, right? So, and Immortal Records, Happy Walters' label is a big reason for that. They signed Corn, they signed Incubus at least for the early albums. And so, you know, it seems like it was destined to be with Jet, that the label that put out Judgment Night would be the label that signs Corn and starts this new metal revolution. They were definitely on to something. And so um, we're going to make a mixtape in a little bit, but I just thought it would be funny to tell you this story. So on uh, Q-Tip's first solo album, he has a song with Jonathan Davis of Corn. It's the last track. 
And I remember reading an interview about how it kind of all came together. And Q-Tip was talking about, you know, they were chatting on the phone. And Q-Tip, uh, when he converted to Islam, he changed his name to Kamal. Yes. But Q-Tip's birth name is Jonathan. And his last name, his birth last name is Davis. So he is also Jonathan Davis. Ha! I did not know that. And so they talked about that. Um, I remember reading an interview about it. That's not why he wanted Jonathan Davis of Corn on the album. But, <laughs> you know, when they're kind of feeling each other out, like that was something that they kind of had a good laugh about. Before we continue with our episode, here's a word from our sponsor. Enjoy listening to podcasts and ever wonder, can I make a podcast? But it seems so complicated and good audio production can take time. What if there was a way to create an amazing podcast easily? Well, now there is. Introducing Podcasting Made Easy from Podtastic Audio. My production team will handle your entire audio production, allowing you to be the star of your show. This is Podcasting Made Easy. How easy? Well, so easy, you don't even have to press record. Now that's easy. Your listeners are waiting. Let's deliver. Sign up for a free strategy call today at podtasticaudio.com slash easy. So in the spirit of your podcast, I was hoping we could make a mini playlist of songs that were songs that have come out after Judgment Night that are kind of cool rap rock collaborations. Sure. And since you are the guest, um, why don't you go first? Well, I'm going to go with one that we talked about earlier. I mean, we talked about how amazing Delta Funky Homo Sapien is. You can't talk about rap rock collaborations and not bring up Gorilla's 2001 self-titled album and Clint Eastwood. Finally, someone let me out of my cage. Like As soon as that song hits, it doesn't matter. It's 22 years old now, and that song comes on. And my kids' heads are bobbing in the car. There is something timeless about it. There's a timeless energy that just feels good, even though it's not an upbeat, fast song. This song is pop rap perfection with a rock vibe to it. I mean, you take one part, Damon Albarn of Blur, you mix in that Brit pop influence, and then you take one part of Del the Funky Homo Sapien, and you get a concoction of rap rock brilliance. So have to go with Clint Eastwood from the Gorillas. Yeah, that's a great one. I mean, I I have every Gorillas album. They're one of my favorites. Huge fan of Blur as well. How do I follow that up? I'm going to follow it up with The Roots featuring Jim James of My Morning Jacket. They have a song called Dear God 2.0, which is off their 2010 album, How I Got Over. So... There's a song called Dear God. It's by Jim James' side project, Monsters of Folk. Mm -hmm. And so they basically reworked it to work with the roots. So it's kind of the chorus and the bridge of the song. So it's not really sampled. And it's just a great, I mean, the roots are a band, right? So they can rock on their own, right? But it's just a seamless, smooth transition of the the, the two styles. And uh, Jim James performed it with them on The Tonight Show when the album came out. Um, He's in the music video. Like, he was very excited to be on this record. And I think after Clint Eastwood, that is uh, is a good back-to-back pairing, in my opinion. Could not agree more. I think I know exactly what I'm going to follow that up with because I have two other songs. But coming out of that, I have to go to 2009 and go with Black Rock, which was a brainchild of Rockefeller's Damon Dash, who was a huge fan of the Black Keys. And he put together this project that combined the Black Keys with Jim Jones and a bunch of other rappers throughout the album. But this album's a musical lightning in a bottle masterpiece from 2009. And I'm going to go with the opening track on the Vista featuring Moss Def, along with Jim Jones. The song just has such a groove to it coming out of the My Morning Jacket Roots vibe. I feel like this one fits in that very well. 
And I, I just wanted to add that this is before the Black Keys were like a household name. Yes, 2009. They didn't have Brothers for, I want to say Brothers was, now I got to, mm, I had to look. I'm sorry, I cheated. Yeah, brothers no, 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 was no 2010. There was a blurred line there. Brothers was the following year. I knew they were close. Yeah, unfortunately for Dame Dash, Brothers came out a year later, or this album would have been much bigger, I think. A hundred percent. But I think people go back to it now and go, man, what? how did we miss this one? I actually had um, the Black Rock album on my list as well. But since we're not going to double up on any album, I'm going to go with Run the Jewels featuring Zach De La Roca. It's off of RTJ2, the second Run the Jewels album. Close your eyes and I'm going to have to curse because it's in the title. Let's close your eyes and count to fuck. <laughs> Is that after three or four? I forgot. <laughs> um, I think it depends. <laughs> um, so I was a, I'm a huge Run of the Jewels fan, Killer Mike and LP. Um, the second album comes out, and all of a sudden there's a song with Zach De La Roca, and he's been on all their albums uh, since. And the story is like they just saw him like walking down the street while they were going to the studio, and they opened the window and said, hey, Zach, can you be on our album? And he said, okay. <laughs> and they were just going to have him do the chorus, which they kind of loop. But after uh, he did that, he said, hey, you guys want me to do a verse? And who says no to a Zach Taylor Roca verse? I wouldn't. <laughs> if that's all you got to do is drive up to him, I'm going to be like, yo, Zach, we got to do an episode of Rage Against the Machine episode of my weekly mixtape. Let's make this happen, man. I bet he would do it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, Run the Jewels, great energy. Uh, they were going to open for Rage on the last tour before Zach broke his leg. Yep. And Zach was going to actually come out and do these features with them. But I feel like uh, without having a band, they totally encompassed like that same energy as Rage Against the Machine. Completely agree. They are carrying the torch right now for rap rock they're one of the bands that when they put out something everybody's kind of tuning in to listen i think that's great uh, i want to see more of it i feel like there's still bands now like Nonpoint that are still doing their thing a lot of the old new metal bands from the early 2000s they're still putting out great stuff but i feel like there's newer bands that are starting to kind of dabble in it and bring kind of the modern hip-hop style into rock music so i'll be curious to see if there's a resurgence like a new metal 2.0 or something but coming out of run the jewels my last pick of the night i'm gonna go what i feel is a collaboration of a musical force of two musical forces that in a collision course bring it to another level and i am going with jay-z and lincoln park on their masterpiece ep collision course which came from an mtv special i was fortunate enough to see lincoln park on tour that summer in new jersey they brought out jay-z as a special guest wow so i got to see numb and encore live and that is the song i'm picking i mean obviously points of authority 99 problems one step closer amazing big pimping and paper cut oh come on but numb and encore just hit on a different level i mean it was it is just incredible and that's all i could say about it like there's no words to describe what a perfectly timed ep this was bringing together two sounds and creating something special in that moment and you could argue both artists were pretty much at their peak at that point too yes yes N nobody benefited from this collaboration it was a mutual benefit that both worlds came together and everybody loved the end result i don't hear many people hating on this one Great pick. I kind of forgot about that one. Like the second you said, I was like, oh, yeah. But <laughs> I'm glad it's mentioned on the playlist because I'm sure people will be like, no, no collision course. <laughs> happy to help. Happy to help. Now I'm curious what your last pick is now, though. Um, my last pick is the 1998 remix for Puff Daddy's It's All About the Benjamin. Yes. Awesome. Perfect. Is it the shot caller remix or is it 
the Dave Grohl rock remix. I've think, heard different the, titles. The one I liked was the Dave Grohl rock remix. I'm almost positive on my CD single. That's what, what it was called. Just the rock remix. Yeah. So you have Dave Grohl and you have Rob Zombie and you have Tommy Stinson of the replacements make you this. It's, it's kind of close to new metal. And it works. Every verse on it is hard and heavy hearing Lil Kim over that and, and, and pop all their verses just, they slay. And let's be honest. Weird Al didn't cover the original Weird Al didn't parody the original version of it's all about the Benjamins. It's all about the Pentiums parodies, the rock remix that shows how important that rock remix was. If it, if it captured Weird Al's attention to do a parody, that means you're at the top with that song. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Spike Jones did the video for the rock remix. It was nominated for MTV's Video of the Year. I think this is the reason why Tommy Stinson ended up in Guns N' Roses. It's a very interesting point. Could very well be. I mean, I'm sure Axel might have been a replacement fan, but, you know, to hear that sound, you know, I'm sure he was like, oh, who can I get in my band? This guy could pull it off. This guy can pull it <laughs> off. Um, so I thought that would be a fitting one. That's from 1998. And that song was huge. Amen. I love it. Absolutely great pick. I'm glad you. I had it on my list. But when we went down to three, I, I, I went with the others. But I, I'm glad that it, it, it's in this discussion tonight. Yeah, I was like, when I thought of it, I was like, oh, this definitely has to be in there. I'm going to have to find a way. And I had a couple other songs that I liked, but I was like, this one is too iconic to leave off the list. I'm glad you put it in. Awesome pick. I loved your picks as well. Um, obviously, big fan of the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, so where can people find you on the internet and where the, can they find My Weekly Mixtape? Sure. The easiest place is myweeklymixtape.com. I have the entire catalog of episodes there. Through there, you can visit all the social media haunts that I am at and every one of them is at my weekly mixtape. So if you're on Facebook, Twitter, X, whatever we want to call it, Instagram, Spoutable, Blue Sky, YouTube, it's at my weekly mixtape. You can also search my weekly mixtape wherever you're listening to podcasts, including great ones like Soundtrack Your Life. So I hope you will connect. If you found me through this show, I'd love to hear from you. And more importantly, I thank you so much for having me on to talk about this soundtrack with you tonight, man. Had a great time once again. Yeah, I'm always excited to have you on. I think, you know, we always have great discussions about music, whether it's on Twitter or X or, you know, whether it's on each other's podcasts. I think we always have a great time. Amen, dude. Thank you so much for, I feel like I'm part of this music community and I'm very thankful for it. So. Yeah, and, I, and I'm really glad that you wanted to do this soundtrack because I feel like when I first started doing a podcast about this, people are like, why are you doing a soundtrack podcast? And then, you know, I tell them about some of my connections to soundtracks and they're like, oh, so are you going to do Judgment Night? And I'm like, <laughs> well, eventually we'll do Judgment Night. Someone will pick Judgment Night. And I'm glad that it was you. Awesome. I'm happy to do it. So, um, so uh, what, what um, episodes do you have coming out in, uh, you know, near the end of the year? All right. Well, we've got some great topics coming your way in the next couple of months. I am doing an episode based on songs from Kevin Smith movies, which will be a soundtrack themed episode that maybe your listeners will be interested in. I'm doing an episode on the cars with Joe Milliken, who wrote a book about Benjamin Orr. So bringing an author's perspective in on the band, uh, doing an episode on underrated rock drummers, which features John Laurie, who's the drummer of Tantric. And I also have topics coming up of Golden Oldies and Doo-Wop, Number One Hits of the 80s, A Christmas Holiday Party, Songs of 2023, and then my new Holiday Week type episode that I'm putting out as a trial run, No Topic at All. Ooh. So it's a challenge because there you cannot do any work 
the guest, we flip a coin and whoever it lands on picks the first song and it's bombs away. See, let's see where it goes. And we only do 10 songs. And at the end of the 10 songs, we each have to try to come up with a name for the, for the mixtape based on the 10 songs we chose. Oh, that sounds so much fun. Yeah, so we got a lot of fun stuff coming on in the show, and maybe you'd like to come on for a No Topic mixtape with me sometime. That'd be a lot of fun. Oh, I'd love to. Let's make it happen. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, thanks again, Brian. Um, and then, obviously, if you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter or Instagram at just SoundtrackCast. Thanks for joining us this week on Soundtrack Your Life. Make sure to visit our website, SoundtrackYourLife.net, where you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. While you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too.